to the Weekly Rush, as your rushed rush through all the weekly uh, movie and streaming news. And uh, it's been nine days, I think, since the last episode. As ever, we're going to start with some of the stories that aren't necessarily about new series or new films or casting choices or anything like that, but more the sort of thematics, the kind of controversies, the kind of off-screen dramatics that come with Hollywood and all that kind of stuff. First story I wanted to talk about was a chap called Ben Platt. If any of you have seen uh, seen the stage play or the movie of Dear Evan Hansen, you'll know that Ben Platt was the boy who was originally on the, in the Broadway show. He received all sorts of plaudits and accolades. But the actor's been talking in interviews since he appeared in the film version or the film adaptation of Dear Evan Hansen. And he talked about the fact that, okay, you know, it caused a lot of controversy that a 27 year old was playing a teenager. I mean, I have to confess, I did think he looked a bit old for the part, but that was hardly his fault. Obviously, as he said, he was aware of the critics, he was aware of negative opinions when he was in the Broadway play, but he said nothing quite as bad as what he experienced on Twitter. Um, he described Twitter as almost exclusively there for tearing people down. Some of the critics, when they, they saw the film, they, they described it as one giant gamble that quite disastrously failed to pay off. And the reason I pulled this story was I thought it was intriguing to look at. Where is the dividing line between trolling, um, being hypercritical and sort of in a sense giving giving talent a dressing down and hitting their self-esteem and being mean being mean okay you can be mean and not be a troll but me, being mean and being a critic being critical being critical of a film dear evan hansen the film was kind of notorious i think it got something like a 22 percent on on or 12 percent on rotten tomatoes so it wasn't liked and i have this feeling sometimes that unless you know when we do movie reviews and whatever i think it's really important to remember that there are humans both on screen and behind the camera making this stuff and Regardless of whether we think it's shit or not, uh, I think there needs to often be some respect afforded to all of the talent and effort and work and graft that's gone into this. So in many regards, why is Ben Platt being sort of hammered, or why was he hammered by the trolls and the critics and what have you, for playing uh, an over, you know being overage, playing a younger character, when in fact it should be the casting director perhaps who was pulled up, or the director who was pulled up, or, or what have you. Um, he described it, Ben Platt, as a d definitely a disappointing experience and difficult. It definitely opened my eyes to the internet and how horrific it can be and I think again the reason for this story is to just pause even when we're critical of films I like to think that we will acknowledge the effort artistry skill and, and 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 you know time has often been put into projects that perhaps don't hit their targets uh, but it better than better than getting personal and saying someone's shit or someone's this it's not to say that every now and then you don't like a performance or what have you but uh but you know i think it's just about tone isn't it it's about uh, being critical uh, and questioning things in a respectful manner ryan murphy's dharma uh, portrait of a monster or a monster the jeffrey dharma story on netflix obviously it's become one of netflix's absolute sort of jewels in the crown of Netflix, no pun intended, as the crown is the crown in the jewel of Netflix, or the jewel in the crown is the crown in Netflix. Anyway, Ryan Murphy, the creator of the Jeffrey Dahmer series, um, has objected to the fact that Netflix have removed the LGBTQ tag. You know, that's the tag that in a sense almost gives you a sense of the genre or topics or category that a, that a new show on the Netflix uh, streamer uh, should appeal to. It's a kind of easy grab. So if you go, oh, this is L it's got an LGBTQ uh, tag, then um, that means it's going to be of relevance to me because I'm interested or I'm part of this community or whatever, what have you. Lots of people complained and had the tag taken down, saying it was a negative use of the LGBTQ tag. There was a feeling that it shouldn't be used. This was a story about a serial killer, and it shouldn't be added almost in terms of genre to the, to the genre of, uh, you know, LGBTQ themes or topics. Well, Ryan Murphy, interestingly, despite this backlash within the gay community, Ryan Murphy has, has disagrees and he thinks that the LGBTQ, God, it's hard to say it so many times, the LGBTQ tag should be put back on the Jeffrey Dahmer series. He was told by Netflix that people were upset because it was an upsetting story. But his comeback is it was a story of a gay man, essentially whether we like it or not. And more importantly, it was a story about his gay victims. So I suppose in a sense he's coming from the perspective of this is not necessarily, well, he's not saying, for, for example, that he was a serial killer because he was gay. But the gayness of the characters means it would have a relevance and perhaps be of interest to the to the LGBTQ community. This is a tricky one. I don't know how I feel about this. I don't know whether, you know, Ryan Murphy, who sort of, he was a little bit kind of irascible when he was asked about whether he'd reached out to the families of the victims, you know, when there was that controversy. And he sort of said, you know, uh, I, we attempted to contact 20, 20 of the families of Dharma's victims. And he said not a single person responded to us in that process, almost a little miffed. And I wonder whether partly, you know, behind this, uh, his desire to get the tag put back is, is maximising its reach, you know, is he, is he wanting to do it for the right reason or the wrong reasons? Which side of the fence do you sit on? Do you think it should be identified as an LGBTQ 
uh, programme or not? Should it just be a serial killer, a sort of real-life crime tag? The Alec Baldwin Rust shooting story, the shooting, tragic shooting of Helena Hutchins, this just rumbles on and on, as is to be expected, really, in a sense. I mean, obviously, Helena Hutchins' husband and children, they've lost. They've lost a dear wife, mother. Uh, you know, she was tragically shot by accident on the set of Rust, a Western that Alec Baldwin was starring in. Um, there's all sorts of lawsuits flying in every direction, one of which which has been stopped is the lawsuit, most sort of, in a sense, most importantly, if you like, from Helena Hutchins's. Um, husband who has turned his efforts to wanting to actually get the film made. However, the the New Mexico County Sheriff, they're, they're still pursuing, you know, uh, criminal proceedings to see if there was any criminality involved. And at the centre of all of it is Alec Baldwin, the guy who was holding the gun and essentially, in inverted commas, though it's been disputed, pulled the trigger. Well, the actor, uh, Alec Baldwin, I think has kind of had enough. I think he's kind of, you know, he's flipped to the other side now. Uh, and he's filed, uh, he's filed a complaint for negligence and indemnification against other members of the crew. He's trying to kind of essentially fan away the responsibility, try and move the narrative on so that it's not just about him because he was holding the weapon in question. So he's brought into the, the firing line, essentially, uh, the armourer, the first assistant director, the props master, and the weapons and rounds supplier. And this is the quote that goes, uh, that, that accompanies Alec Baldwin's complaint. This tragedy happened because live bu bullets were delivered to the set and loaded into the gun. The armourer failed to check the bullets or the gun carefully. Uh, Halls, the uh, assistant director, failed to check the gun carefully and yet announced the gun was safe before handing it to Baldwin. The props master failed to disclose that the armourer had been acting recklessly offset and was actually a safety risk to those around us. So the armourer is very much in the crosshatches here. Uh, this could backfire on Baldwin, um, you know, because, you know, as soon as you start to split from the rest of the crowd, you know, as a unit, they were kind of in a sense, it felt like they were moving on and the film was going to get made and they were going to go back into production. But now Baldwin's kind of peeled off and he said, no, you know what? He's kind of, he's running away from the rest of the pack. His lawsuit then goes on to say, Baldwin has lost numerous job opportunities and associated income. He's been fired from multiple jobs because of the incident on Rust and has been passed over for other opportunities as a direct result of the negligence of all of the, uh, you know, um, people involved, armourer, props, master, all that kind of stuff. So he's definitely trying to say, it's your shit, I'm just the kind of fall guy at the front of the set who was holding the gun. This is why it happened, it's all your fault. Which seems to tug against the narrative of getting the film remade. I pulled this story, it's an interesting, it's less a story, it's more an opinion or a thought piece or something, it's something to open up a discussion. Uh, the director, Danny Boyle, was at the BFI, British Film Institute, and he was celebrating, I think, tw the 20th anniversary, 20 years of his movie, 28 Days Later. You know, Danny Boyle made films like Shallow Grave, Train Spotting, The Beach. He's 66 years old, obviously he made Slumdog Millionaire. I think he won Best Director Oscar for that. But whilst he was talking about the 20 year anniversary of the film, 28 Days Later, he came out with this phrase, and it made me stop in my tracks when I saw it. He said, it's a terrible thing to say at the home of British film, but I'm not sure we're great filmmakers, to be absolutely honest. Think about that, just let that settle in. As a nation, he says, our two art forms are theatre, in a middle class sense, and pop music, because we are extraordinary at it. Now, I really like Trainspotting, though I've gone back to see it and it's very much of its time. It, it, he, he can be a great director, Danny Boyle. I've never been a big fan, ironically, of Danny Boyle. Because for me, he sits in that category of filmmaker who is a British filmmaker who doesn't make... For me, I, th I agree with him, but I would almost include him in that list. I can't work out whether he's saying this, but he's kind of also saying, I'm the exception. I don't think so, because he's not that egotistical a chap. Um, but what do you think? Discuss. Are the Brits really... Because when I think of most British films, so many films, it's not, not that we can't tell good stories. I think one of our other strengths isn't, uh, isn't just theatre and pop music, it's television. And I always feel that when I watch many British made films, that these feel like television films or television dramas or stuff that would be on the square box uh, of the 1970s or 80s. It always feels sort of, and it always feels a bit costume drama y and it always feels very plummy and a bit Englishy and all that kind of stuff. Weirdly, I think I agree with 85% of what he's saying. I think when I know that a very British film is being released, like, I don't know, Fisherman's Friends or something, it's not that I don't want to go and have fun or support the British film industry. I just kind of know what I'm going to get. There aren't many surprises, I find, in British feature films. And whether that's because it takes so much to get the film made, but then sometimes I look at these films and think, how the fuck have you got this made? Maybe he's right. Maybe we're better at theatre. But I would add to his categories, theatre, pop music and television. Discuss, what do you think? I don't know if you remember us discussing a while back, um, a lawsuit was being slapped against Top Gun Maverick by the uh, writers of uh, an original article that was published in a magazine, California magazine, 
written by Ehud Yone uh, back in the 80s or 70s. And he wrote a piece which was about the pilots and the programme that was located in a second floor cubby of offices at Hangar One at Miramar. So basically Top Gun, the original film, was based on an article written by this chap. Their cl- and the chap who wrote it, his fa- or his family, are making a, c- a claim against Top Gun Maverick, uh, seeking damages and seeking kind of money, essentially, from the massive one and a half billion or whatever it is that the film's made, claiming that they made the sequel, and that when they made the sequel, uh, their kind of ownership, they bought the copyright of the article, had, had elapsed two years earlier. And so the claimants are essentially saying, but you've made another film about the same sort of subject and the copyright was ours and you hadn't bought the copyright back. It had fallen out of copyright by two years. Paramount have really pushed back on this saying, you know, look, this is absolute nonsense. But Paramount have experienced a bit of a setback. Their efforts to have the lawsuit dismissed have been denied. The court concluded that the uh, claimant contains sufficient well-pleaded facts to state viable claims for copyright infringement, breach of contract and declaratory relief. Paramount came back saying well, that while the court declined to dismiss the this case at the very early stage we will continue to vigorously defend it so this is a lose this is a this is a fail right at the beginning here it hasn't been dismissed the court feels there's enough of a, uh, a claim to be had here to be discussed and, and, and kind of thrashed through in court if this goes against Paramount I could imagine that the family of the guy who wrote the original article could be in line for an enormous amount of money I think the way this may end up playing out is that Paramount will settle for an out-of-court settlement. But when your film has made over one and a half billion dollars, what is that amount? What amount do you settle on? And is it curious that the timing of the claim came only once Top Gun Maverick was a hit? Hmm, maybe that could be the Paramount's main defence. And so we come to some of the kind of new movies, new projects, casting decisions, directorial decisions, and all that kind of malarkey. Uh, the first story is A Quiet Place, Day One. Uh, Paramount, again, they've uh, tapped up Lupita Nyong'o to star in a spin-off from the A Quiet Place sort of realm, if you like, that's been created by John Krasinski, obviously husband and wife team, him and Emily Blunt, starred in the first and second films. Lupita Nyong'o is joining uh, A Quiet Place, Day One. This is being directed by a brilliant director called Michael Sarnowski, who was responsible for Pig, the film starring Nick Cage. So I think he could bring a real indie sensibility to this. Uh, as I say, this is a spin-off. This is not a threequel or a part of the kind of, it's not part of a trilogy, it's a spin-off. Um, and there's a hope, I think, at Paramount that, you know, they'll be able to create a universe based, I think it's quite hard to create a universe around one alien invasion. Do you know what I mean? I mean, you can create a universe around multiple multiple superheroes and Star Wars and all that, and Lord of the Rings and all that malarkey, but can you really around the same type of monster invading Earth? Because we've kind of seen it now, so it needs to, there needs to be more scope to it in some way. Anyway, um, there is also a third Quiet Place in development, but that's separate to this, a Quiet Place Day One, and Lupita Nyong'o is a great get for this project. Obviously, she can be currently seen uh, reprising her role in Black Panther Wakanda forever. Mads Mikkelsen, Mads Mikkelsen from Fantastic Beasts, from he's just such a great actor isn't he he's just you know brilliant Hannibal all that kind of stuff he's reuniting with Brian Fuller the creative force behind Hannibal uh, they're going to work together on a project called Dust Bunny Mads Mickelson. he was in a great film called The Hunt The Hunt was it The Hunt or The Hunted in which he played a school teacher who was accused of abusing a child and it's such a compelling intimate emotional portrait it's just it's just a brilliant film I think it's called The Hunt maybe it's called The Hunt Anyway, Matt Mickelson, Brian Fuller, he of Hannibal fame. Uh, he, he also, incidentally, uh, Brian Fuller is involved with a Friday the 13th prequel series that's coming called Crystal Lake. The log line on Dust Bunny sounds great. It's the story of an eight-year-old girl who enlists the help of her intriguing neighbour, played by Mads Mickelson, to kill a monster under her bed that she believes ate her family. It's a bit fantastical, a bit fantasy-esque. A bit Grimm's fairy tale, a bit like that film Hatched that was out re- recently, or Hatching. Uh, sounds intriguing, doesn't it? Uh, I think that could be fun. It's called Dust Bunny. But as I just mentioned, uh, Brian Fuller is also behind um, the Friday the 13th prequel series, which is called Crystal Lake. It's being described as an expanded prequel. So yeah, why are you? You were Friday the 13th. And I have to say, I think of all those sort of 80s horrors, Friday the 13th for me was the least convincing. Though for some people, it, it was their sort of, I think for Nadia, it was her defining horror movie experience. 
The new movie uh, starring uh, Millie Bobby Brown called The Electric State or Electric State, which is based on Simon Stallenhag's uh, rather wonderful graphic novel. We've talked about it a lot before. It co-stars Millie Bobby Brown. It's also got Chris Pratt in there. Um, it's been directed by the R Russo brothers, who you know obviously of Avengers fame and all that kind of stuff. The story, as we've said before, follows a teenage girl who realizes that a strange but sweet robot who comes to her has actually been sent by her missing brother. So it's kind of trying to reunite family across a bleak apocalyptic land. Landscape. Um, so they've expanded the cast on this. Joining the cast are Billy Bob Thornton. Yeah, he's always good, isn't he? Even though his hair is always a bit strange, he's always good. Giancarlo Esposito. He's always fantastic. Obviously, he was uh, he was in uh, Breaking Bad. Um, Anthony Mackie, the new Captain America, and Kei Hui Kwan is going to be in there. He of Everything Everywhere All at Once, and ironically, he's replacing Michelle Yeoh in this project. So this project's really thickening out into quite a far-ranging, ambitious sort of, you know, Chris Pratt seems almost to be the sort of sleeping kind of partner in this. I mean, although he's in it, it's not being sort of championed enough. I don't know whether Chris Pratt's star has kind of waned somewhat in recent years. Tragically, uh, a side sidebar story involved with the Electric State project is that uh, early uh, last week, um, a crew member was tragically killed in an offset car crash. There's no clarification on who it was, um, but it was a member of the crew and team, and uh, many of the members of the cast and crew had to have sort of counselling but yeah, tragically, one of the members, one of the crew members on the film uh, was killed in a car crash off set. Sean Levy, one of the key creators or creatives behind Stranger Things. Uh, he's also in the process of making Deadpool 3. He was the great, great head behind Free Guy, which they're talking about making a sequel uh, of uh, with Ryan Reynolds. It was, if you haven't seen it, Free Guy, it's, it's pleasantly surprising. It's very inventive. It's very funny, very witty and, and technologically incredibly impressive too. So there's a sequel for that, uh, Free Guy. Well, he's being talked about as potential making a Star Wars film. He's sort of being added to the, the rogues gallery of various names of various directors who are all being promised kind of Star Wars. The keys to a Star Wars. Uh, you like, like the keys to a Beamer. Are they, are they going to be able to turn the ignition key and get any of them started? That's the question. You've got people like Ryan Johnson, Rian Johnson, you've got Patty Jenkins, you've got um, Kevin Feige, you've got Taika Waititi, and now you've got Sean Levy in there. Which one is going to be the next one? I mean, there hasn't been a Star Wars film in the theatres since 2019. It feels like it's all going down to Disney+. Plus. And Andor, which is a cracking series, by the way, isn't it, Ninad, um, isn't delivering the numbers that you would hope it would for such a good series on Disney+. Plus. And so the danger here is that even good stuff... See, I'm of the opinion that Solo was a really good Star Wars film. Even good stuff, if it doesn't perform, will get marginalised. I think, personally, I think the Star Wars realm is under threat. And I'm, I, I hope that what they're trying to do by having all this chatter about who's directing these films is generate all that excitement. And I'm hoping that since 2019, if it stretches to, two, well, it's going to have to stretch to 2023, more likely 2024, they're trying to recreate that five-year gap so that they can get that renewed burst of interest and box office success. This is a nice little story. Star Wars and Studio Ghibli. I can't I can't admit that I'm a Studio Ghibli fan. I, I, it just it hasn't spoken to me. I was the wrong age. I think if I was younger, you know, maybe I would have liked it. But lots of people are very excited about this latest story. And this is Lucasfilms and Studio Ghibli um, are joining forces with a project or a short film on Disney Plus called Zen, Grogu and Dust Bunnies. And the other idea called Dust Bunny. Um, it, it's a sort of going to be a wonderful creative partnership in which the rather adorable Grogu from The Mandalorian, you know, Tiny Yoda, Baby Yoda, though people don't like calling them by Baby Yoda, uh, and the uh, Coal Dust Bunnies from uh, Spirited Away are going to be brought together in a short. This is exciting too. I, I quite like this sort of, it's not manga, I know, but this kind of meeting of Lucasfilm and Star Wars with other, there was the manga series or anime series, wasn't there, of Star Wars, and I didn't really hear much about that, but I think this is kind of, this is getting people excited. Any Guillermo del Toro fans out there? I like him. He never quite hits for me. I think Pan's Labyrinth is one of my favourites. Kronos, I liked. Um... I quite liked his Hellboy, but they never, they, they start interestingly for me, but never quite have the punch follow through that I'm looking for. Nightmare Alley, mm, jury's out on, it was all right. Yeah, uh, his new stop frame Pinocchio is about to come out. Um, obviously, his Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities. I'm hearing great things about that, actually, on Netflix. I will be checking that out. Obviously, it's a sort of anthology series, almost like his version of The Twilight Zone with lots of films made by different directors. Um, well, he's been on, I think, on Twitter or on Instagram. He posted uh, some footage, test footage, that was shot or made or created with Industrial Light and Magic uh, some years ago uh, for a project that was called The Mountains of Madness, an HP Lovecraft project. Um, he released the test footage. 
online uh, and I thought why not why don't we just have a look at it It seems to be the vibe, doesn't it, with all monstery type things that they have sort of these kind of great big legs. I'm thinking of a quiet place that we were talking about earlier, and uh, you know, so many films they sort of have these sort of awkward sort of crab legs. I mean, they look like they've not sort of evolved along meaningful lines. It sort of looks really awkward. I like that sort of almost self birth of the humanoid body from the centre of the creature. You see, I think he's he's a great visualist. I think he's 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 more a sort of ideas man. But I find, sometimes find in his execution that I don't know. It's just. It's not, I don't know what it is. It, it, what is it that I don't get about Guillermo del Toro? It just doesn't kick it to the back of the net. It starts with a great premise, and then it just gets a bit ridiculous, or not scary enough, or maybe it's maybe it's because it's too polished, or maybe it's too cleanly thought an idea that there's not enough. Maybe it's because it's too magic realist, not realist enough. There's too much. Yeah, man, I think that might be it. I think that might be the problem. Any fans of Severance out there? You know, we were huge fans of Severance. This is the uh, the series starring Adam Scott. Uh, it, it included Christopher Walken. Um, it's produced by Ben Stiller. Severance season two is coming, and it, what a cast they're adding to it. Got Gwendolyn Christie, uh, she of Game of Thrones and The Sandman. Got Bob Balaban, actor and director. Merritt Weaver, Alia Shawcat. Um, lots of people coming in uh, to join the original cast, too. Uh, ben Stiller said of the recommendation or the reorder of season two for Apple. He says, we're thrilled and delighted to be back on set for the exciting second chapter of Severance. Though we don't know how long we've been gone or who we are outside, we are told people enjoy the show and we can be happier. That's him lightheartedly referencing the fact that uh, in Severance, basically the characters in it have elected to undergo a sort of procedure that severs their personal life from their professional life. It's the same person, but when they go through the process of kind of checking into work and checking out of work, uh, they only they enter their life and they have no memory or understanding of their lives in each realm. Um, and it's discovered that actually uh, at the center of this kind of work-life balance experiment, there's a sort of strange mystery at the heart of it. I don't want to ruin it for you, but uh, yes, an incredibly very well executed, thought-provoking, layered kind of series. And so the idea that season two's coming is really exciting, I think. Wonder Man, we've been talking about Wonder Man. Forget Wonder Woman. I thought there was only a Wonder Woman. No, there's a Wonder Man now, isn't there? There's a Wonder Man. Uh, we've talked about this a fair bit. This is coming to Disney+, Plus, another Marvel series. Aren't we getting too many Marvel series? I've got a feeling we might be. Um, so, yeah, Marvel series. Uh, Yahya Abdul-Mateen, he of um, The Candyman, he of... Aquaman, Matrix Resurrections. Um, he is joining, uh, well, he's going to be Wonder Man in the Marvel Comics series. This is the series that also, a couple of weeks ago, we were reporting that Ben Kingsley is going to be reprising his role as T Trevor Slattery, the uh, appalling amateur dramatics actor who uh, appeared in Iron Man 3. He's very, very funny. So this is shaping up again into being something that's, that sounds quite watchable. Yaya at the centre of it is a really meaningful get. Uh, ben Kingsley's ridiculous character in it makes it quite watchable for me too. So Wonder Man man is, is, is gaining pace. Another series I'm really excited about is The Penguin. This is coming from DC, obviously a spin-off from The Batman. Uh, Colin Farrell as The Penguin. If you haven't seen Colin Farrell in The Banshees of Inner Sharon, please check it out. I mean, what a versatile actor that you can spin from that idiot in the middle of on the on the middle of a you know isolated Irish island to the Penguin in Gotham City. Um, they've cast uh, Christine Milioti uh, as the female lead opposite the Penguin. She's going to play Carmine Falcone. Carmine Falcone. Any DC fans, you'll really know this character. I think she's been played by other actresses in other, other series, I think Gotham and stuff. But Milotti, you'll know, or you might know, from um, Palm Springs, which was the Sundance Darling movie. Very funny. If you haven't seen it, check out Palm Springs about a couple who essentially keep going it's a bit groundhog day but it's incredibly an incredibly inventive riff on that kind of tree treading the same day again and again a romance develops and she has real comedy chops i, I really like christine Milotti. when we were watching it we were all like wow who is this girl she's fantastic she's a real standout so she's been cast opposite colin farrell in the penguin series coming from matt reeves's corner of the dc fandom not entirely sure how i feel about this the sandman were you a fan were you were you a fan we started with i started reviewing some of the episodes 
I then got bogged down in sort of, I just couldn't, it couldn't keep pulling me back. I got to episode four and a lot of you were saying that I should have stuck to episode five because it got really interesting from there. I don't want to sit through four episodes before something becomes interesting. Anyway, Neil Gaiman's The Sandman. Uh, it looks like they've reordered, though it hasn't been officially confirmed. It looks like they're reordering a second season or more tales. They're going to be more stories of the endless. Could there be a clue in that, though? Could there be a clue in that? Because this, this, this comment was uh, released, I think, and then deleted by DC, because, of course, it's based on a DC comic. Uh, but the, the original release, or the original comment that was sort of slipped out from DC and has since been deleted, said, The dream continues. Uh, Sandman will return with new episodes based on multiple volumes of the Neil Gaiman graphic novel to explore even more stories of the endless. Is the clue there in more stories of the endless? I, there was something a bit stilted and a bit stiff and a bit wooden for me about it all. It all felt a bit too organised and graphic novelised in not a good way. It didn't feel like it flowed or had fluidity to it. I just felt, I found him very, I just found him too stick-like and he'd just stand there and he, anyway, it didn't do it for me. Does it do it for you? Because season two's, it does it for someone because it looks like season two's coming. This is potentially exciting news. You see, this is, for my generation, when you hear stories like this, you immediately go to the story and you go, yeah, 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 this is really good. And then you kind of look at the Marvel Disney landscape uh, Star Wars landscape, and you think, mm, is this a good thing? Okay, so this is, get ready for it, Indiana Jones TV series being eyed by Disney+. Plus. Everything is being looked at as a potential to be mined and sort of uh, streamed and turned into series. And at first I saw this and I thought, yeah, Indiana Jones, that's really cool, a series. And then I thought, oh man, are we really running the risk here of destroying all of the content of the 70s, or more 80s and 90s now, by diluting it, in a sense, diluting the original IP or intellectual property, the original creations, with this sort of constant hiving off of layers of, of, of that original idea into new iterations. Sometimes it can work, for sure, spin-offs and all that kind of stuff. But sometimes I just worry it dilutes things. So this is the story that essentially um, Disney and Lucasfilm are considering bringing the show to Disney Plus. Perhaps you know they keep they keep having meetings apparently at Disney, and they keep discussing with writers whether this is something that could happen. It does. I don't think Harrison Ford will be coming back to it. His you know obviously uh, Indiana Jones Five is coming out soon. That's going to be his last. It's going to be his last outing as the intrepid archaeologist. They have done this before. There was the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. You know when, again, if I think about it in the past. My worry is that a lot of these new series that are coming through on Disney+, Plus, which you, you would think, oh yeah, they're putting proper money in these, they're beginning to slowly, like with She-Hulk, which we liked, but in terms of execution, you're beginning to feel a sort of cheapness creep in. A little bit like when you'd see a Marvel series or a Disney or a DC series on a Chuckaway channel you'd never heard of, so that it becomes just like any other TV series, rather than the special tentpole moment of special effects and all sorts of stuff. So, my worry with this is that you're going to take something that's very cinematic and you're going to make it very televisual. But I don't want Indiana Jones to be televisual. I want him to be cinematic. Which brings us to films of the week, or more accurately this week, film of the week. I mean, there's no escaping it, but the big, big, big release of this week, and if you look at all the listings and all the cinemas, there's virtually nothing else on any of them, is Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Um, our review is up on the channel, uh, do go and check it out. There's not much to say about this other than, obviously, uh, a lot of attention is being given to the film because it's uh, been made in the aftermath of the tragic passing away of Chadwick Boseman. I think I'm not ruining our review if I, if, if I say, you know, I think what makes this film stand out amongst the kind of busy, busy superhero output that's happening with Marvel and DC principally on streaming but also at the cinema is that there is an authenticity if you like to the characters and the actors in this responding reacting to and processing the tragic loss of Chadwick Boseman and so you know I think if you fancy you know a real kind of bit of escapist kind of superhero stuff but it's kind of flecked through with a sense of sadness and loss but also uh, a sort of moving on and pushing on it stars uh, Letitia Wright who's at the centre of it she's absolutely fantastic um, so do check it out if you fancy it's, it's a long film it's long so make sure you, you stock up on popcorn get a few packets of extra packets of minstrels and all that kind of stuff but i don't think you'll be disappointed it's, it's really well acted it's it clips along um and for me there are parts of it that made me more excited about underwater epic films than avatar ever could so uh that for me is kind of pretty much the only movie of the week it's the tent pole release of the week and possibly could be the biggest release of the year it's got dr strange to be and there you have this week's Weekly Rushes, your rush rush through all the weekly movie and streaming news. Tell us your thoughts on any of the stories, share your thoughts below, and we hope you have a wonderful film-watching weekend. For more film and family fun, don't forget to click the subscribe button and make sure to click the bell to never miss an update.